yoga, you could say for starters, yoga means plus. It means to add something. It means addition. That's actually one of the translations of yoga. It means plus. It means to incorporate something, to add something to your life. So there's two kinds of yoga, as it's explained um, in the Sanskrit text. There's Sabija Yoga, and there's, uh, what is it, Nirbija and Sabija. So one is lifeless yoga, one is called living yoga. So lifeless yoga is kind of like, yoga also means union. So sometimes, like if the sun meets with the moon, that's like an eclipse, right? So they can call that a yoga. So yoga means to connect, to make a connection, right? Plus, right? So... So, one is theoretical. It's like, oh, I want to go to this place. I want to go to Hawaii. So, right there, it's theoretical. It's lifeless. But when you actually go there, it's living, right? You're actually living there. So, you can think of it like that. There's two kinds of yoga. One is called lifeless yoga. And one is called living yoga. So, living yoga means that you're actually living in the proper yoga consciousness. And that's actually where you derive benefit. That's where we can derive benefit from yoga. Not just a theoretical idea, but actually something that can give us a greater advantage in our life. Something that can bring us a greater amount of satisfaction and pleasure. Uh, it, imp it will improve the quality of our life, our relationships, everything we do. So there are six, what I've done here tonight, this is actually a very ancient uh, hymn, and it's spoken by Kapila. Kapila, he's one of the original founding fathers of yoga. It goes back many, many thousands and thousands of years. He spoke a very concise uh, verse, a text, which talks about six steps to living yoga. So these are six steps how to live in yoga conscious, not just a theoretical like, oh, I practice yoga or I'll be enlightened one day. But this is very practical uh, stuff that you can do, whether you're at work, you're at school, or whatever you're doing in life. So the first one, he says, first step, if you want to be a living yogi, if you want to live it, is the first step is one, if you want to be happy, you got to have santosh, you have to have, be content. So. This is the first step, contentment. He gives uh, an indication, an indication is given how to find that contentment. He says, everything comes on its own accord. This is actually a very revolutionary idea, and it's hard for us to grasp because we get really attached to things, right? And if we get something, we don't want it to go away. <laughs> and if we don't have it, we, we really want it, you know? So uh, how many of us, I guess I would say, how many of us uh, are expecting some kind of situation that will give us happiness in the future? Pretty much everyone, right? So, and how, how many of us aspire for that and want that? Okay, everyone. So, how much of us, how, how many of us uh, want suffering? Aspire for suffering? Like, yeah, we, we're looking forward to that. No, okay, nobody. <laughs> but, uh, let me tell you, let me ask you this. Does suffering... Even that you don't want suffering, does it still come? Yes. Yeah. Of course. It comes without you asking for it, right? So why do we think that happiness is not going to come without us asking for it? Why do we think that we have to control, we have to create this situation? This is, a, this is his first point. He said, uh, so the first thing is, in Sanskrit, it's whatever comes at its own sweet will, you accept and you become content. This is the first step. So contentment, and this is a really powerful thing. It's something that we're lacking. You can have millions of dollars, but if you don't have contentment, you can't enjoy, you can't even enjoy one penny of it. So it's more valuable to have contentment than it is to have money. Because if you have contentment, you can be satisfied with one dollar. But if you don't have any, you can't be satisfied with a million dollars. So that's the first thing. Learn how to be content, and you'll increase your happiness in life. Two, this is pretty revolutionary in our culture. He says, mitabun, uh, the actual translation in Sanskrit means to eat exactly as much as necessary. And the formula that they give there is, you should fill your belly half of food, then you should drink one-fourth of the portion of your belly with water and leave one-quarter for air. So it's a very, uh, in other words, 
it's a whole state of mind. It's not just eating, but really what it means is to regulate your physical activity and to and it also goes to the first one, to be satisfied with just as much as you need. Not that what you want, but just what the body needs. Like why do you overeat? Because you're like, oh I want to enjoy, right? So it's it's a science it's a way to become more happy by to regulate yourself. So this is the second thing. If it's it's so revolutionary. Just by regulating your physical activity, you can achieve so much. Uh, so that's being recommended there, is re uh, regulate your sleep, uh, what time you go to sleep, what time you eat, what time you work, what time you play. Everything you do, uh, try to have some structure, some organization. It, it creates a peace of mind. It, create, it gives us peace of mind. And it helps us be able to be content in those situations. So regulate the senses and the mind, number two. Number three, this is called Muni. To be a Muni means to be very thoughtful. So this is rule number three. If you want to be happy, you've got to be thoughtful. You've got to use the brain that the universe, Krishna, has given us. We have to use this higher intelligence of the human being. So if you never inquire, like, is there a ha higher happiness? You're never going to get that higher happiness, right? So first step is to be thoughtful. People today, happiness is a, is a commodity in this culture right now. <laughs> People aren't very happy. They're walking around like they're going to the electric chair. They're, <laughs> they're staring down at the ground like everyone. And what, people aren't having fun. People are talking about work and like money and this is because of the economy. So in order to uh, be happy, you got to be thoughtful. you got to be thoughtful about every aspect of your life. you got to think, is this where I want to be? Is this where I want to live? Is this the people that I want to spend my life with? you really got to think about that. And uh, asking yourself, shall receive. So number four, this is, uh, this is pretty cool. Uh, Vivekta Shanana. Shanta. Vivekta Sharna means, he says, take shelter of solitude. Um, there's, a, there's many different ways to look at this. So first one, from a, like a diehard yogi perspective, living in the Himalayas, he's like, yes, he's going to live in a cave, and I'm not going to talk to anyone. I'll meditate here all day. So that's, uh, that's definitely one aspect of it. Uh, and the ability to be peaceful alone. In other words... This is, this is actually very difficult, to be happy in your own company, to be satisfied in your own company. Uh, but more so, I wanted to kind of, because I know, because of my other knowledge of this subject, um, I actually know that it's referring to another thing. It doesn't mean just being alone and forsaking the world and society, living in a cave. It actually means not to associate with the worldly stereotyped activities. Really, that's what it means. So associating with spiritually minded people who are on that the same path toward character development, higher knowledge, wisdom, that's as good as being in solitude, actually. And it, it's, it's like being comfortable with yourself because it's somebody who's also cultivating of the heart, right? So uh, I would kind of put it like this. Uh, in order to be peaceful, one has to stay out of the, the fashion and trends of the world. So the world has a lot of trends, has a lot of fashions, and you can easily get caught up in that. Like, oh, what's the latest this? What's the latest that? And it's very uh, apathetical to peace, peace of mind. So peace of mind comes from stability. And our culture very much pushes instability and change like on us constantly. Like, oh, you know, this is new. So um, it's being recommended to step out of that and more so I would say than being alone is walk alone the, 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 the strength to walk your own path everyone's going this way and oh it's easy to go that way and just be a little follower but it takes more strength to do what you know is right and walk your own path there was a yogi there was a book of like mystic yogis and one yogi said it was pretty profound it was pretty profound <laughs> He said, uh, just be you. Just <laughs> He's like, in other words, like that's kind of the mind is like, oh, I need to be like this person, or, or this person has this quality. I need to be more like that. It's like, 
he said, own your own life. That's what it said, the quote. It's like, just when you just own your own life, whatever you are, for good or for worse, just own it. That's, that's, what's, that's what's there anyways. So uh, that, that's kind of significant, the ability to walk alone. And it's conducive to peace. You're not stuck in the trends, the fashions, and the whole thing. So moving on. Number five, uh, this is how to interact with others. So you walk alone, but you, you're not a hermit. You're still able to deal with people, even if they're in the worldly trends. So this is two things that you need to deal with others, and it deals with relationship. One is called mitra, it means friend, friendliness. Two is called karuna, it means compassion. So this is a way to develop your relationship with others. So mitra means friendliness. It means people who are on your equal level. People who consider, uh, friend, you know, equal in statu stature. Um, karuna means mercy. It means compassion. People who are less, uh, you know, younger than you, then you, you show some special care for them, right? So um, this is being recommended, but more so it's recommended to have an unconditional attitude. And that's something uh, maybe in the culture today we don't always have. We're like, oh, I'm your friend and... But, you know, the person doesn't treat you right, then you're like, ah, get out of here, you know? It's like, I, I was nice, but now I'm not going to be nice to you anymore. So, uh, really, that's something that will make us happy, is to have our own unconditional attitude of friendship and compassion towards others, regardless of how they respond towards us. That takes a lot of strength. That takes a lot of power to do that. Anyone who's done, who's tried to do that, you'll know. It's not easy. It's It's easy to be mean to the person who's mean to you, isn't it? <laughs> but to be unconditionally a friend and compassionate, even when a person's not, that's real yoga. So number six, Atmavan, this is the last one, and it kind of sums up. Atmavan means self-possessed. Uh, it also means self-treasure. So this is kind of the essence of all of these qualities, is the basic... I would say my one of my basic realization, my personal realization of yoga, is that that's really what yoga is there to teach us how to awaken uh, our inner asset or our inner wealth. Generally, we put our wealth on the external world, isn't it? Like the money, the whatever our position, and we aspire towards that, and we really cling on to that. And we depend on that, and that creates a lot of weak qualities within us. Fear, anxiety, uh, you know, anger, lust, greed. Uh, it's a source of all kind of... But really, the solution is to become a self-treasure. In order to do that, you have to know what the self is. So, th the most basic understanding in yoga philosophy is the body is just merely a vehicle for consciousness. So, this body, it's just... If you look at it, it's there's a lot of water here. <laughs> In fact, all bodies are you know, composed of water and elements. The same thing you're going to find in the ocean. <laughs> it's just made of nature. So we are not the body. The body is just merely a vehicle. And when we understand that the body has all these kind of limitations, but we ourself, our consciousness, uh, dare I say spirit, it's kind of a strange word <laughs> in our culture today, but spirit, I guess consciousness, Consciousness is what we truly are, and that consciousness is not limited by the physical, uh, the physical boundaries of this body. And you know, what, if we put our value, for example, in physical beauty, then uh, that's a limitation. So we have to put our value in ourself. And when you realize that what we are, you'll you'll begin to make a lot of more progress back to the natural state, which we should all be in, which is happiness. So I'm just going to recap, then you can ask a question or comment. So, six steps to living yoga by Kapila. This is authentic yoga coming from Kapila thousands of years ago. The first one is learn contentment. You'll be much more happier. Two, 